Alex, it's it's amazing. Like when we look at the, you know, I had all sympathy for Venezuela. I've been there many times. I had I supported Bolivarian government very much. But when we look at what is going on there, it's 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 so despairing. Yeah. And Bolivia was also supported of Morales, but after going there, no, two, three times interviewing tens of, 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 of people and seeing, they're just going against the common people. And then when you look at what's what's going on in Ecuador, what, my, my point here is when we when we see that this is happening across the countries, this is not something that has to do with the individual. It, if it's a pattern, it has to do with, yeah. you know, with the structures of it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Aote Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. It's Tuesday, the 9th of March. My name, as always, is Alex Hochuli. This week, George and Phil are away. So today, it's just myself and my guest, who I'll introduce in just a second. And we'll be talking about Latin America and the phenomenon known as the Pink Tide, uh, something we've broached in various episodes uh, over the past uh, couple of years, uh, but we've never actually done an episode trying to synthesize what it was all about. And to do that, we're joined by Fabio Luis Barbosa dos Santos, or Fabio Luis for short, uh, who's Professor of International Relations at Unifespi in Sao Paulo, and the author of an excellent new book, which is out in English, uh, as well as the original in in Portuguese. Uh, In English, it's called Power and Impotence, a History of South America under progressivism, 1998 to 2016. And that came out just at the end of 2020 uh, on Haymarket Books. Hi, Fabio. How are you? And uh, where are you calling us from exactly? Uh, Hi, Alex. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Excellent. This is uh, one of those rare opportunities where could have done an episode in person, looking at someone um, and talking to them, which would have been which would have been nice. But unfortunately, uh, we are back into red phase here, and uh, yeah, kind of lockdown. So uh, that unfortunately we'll have to have to wait for another time post pandemic. Yes. Yeah. So um, so just to say a little bit about the book before uh, before I bring you in, Fabio, to to answer a whole bunch of questions, um, trying to bring together what the the pink tide or the progressive wave, as you call it, was about. Um, the book I really enjoyed it. I may mean, actually read kind of a bit of the English and a bit of the the Brazilian version. Uh, the Brazilian version uh, for for our Brazilian listeners is called Uma História da Onda Progressista Sul Americana, um, and uh, the version I have here it's uh, it's from uh, Elefante Editora. It's actually a really nice book and kind of. Um, with those kind of colored tabs on the side to jump to one country or another, which is actually really excellent because I'm going to refer back to it um, as I, as I go forward in, in life um, uh, because it works as an excellent reference to kind of refer back to, to this period in, in Latin American history. And you can look really country by country um, as well as read it obviously as a, as a book and as its whole. Um, so as I say, the book goes country by country, but also presents a continental view, um, and one that also presents a lot of emphasis on the role of relations between the countries, especially uh, in the form of regional integration attempts. Now, that can sound sometimes a bit boring or functional or technical, you know, the stuff of relative trade tariffs and so on, uh, but Fabio really politicizes these efforts, uh, both being critical of what happened uh, with integration attempts, as well as proposing um, a form of socialist integration, which we're going to talk about towards the end of the episode. You'll have to stick around for that. Um, Just a couple of notes um, on what unifies Latin America, if you're not familiar with its history, and I'm going to paraphrase from Fabio's book. Um, what unifies the experience, despite the various divergences uh, between the countries, is a common colonial past, a combination of dependence and inequality. And in the economic sphere, um, you can trace the kind of a, a recent history, I mean, since the, let's say, the 1940s onwards, um, which is fairly um, common across the continent. So you have import substitution industrialization, followed by the internationalization of domestic markets, followed by debt crisis, inflation, full-blown neoliberalism. And then you have this commodity super cycle um, of uh, inflated commodity prices, uh, which helps exporters in these countries, and followed by recession most recently. And this kind of, ma- this is sort of mapped onto um, the political sphere, which also follows through these processes of national developmentalism, uh, a period of revolution versus counter-revolution, a transition, then the weakening of conventional political parties, followed by the progressive wave, which is obviously what we're going to be talking about, as well as a conservative ascent that comes after it. Um, 
But I want to also highlight that this isn't just a history lesson about, you know, some moderately successful center left projects and maybe some failed, more radical ones, um, which is, I think, more or less the common view on, on what the pink tide or the progressive wave was. Um, it's worth recalling the kind of very live history at the moment on these things, or at least until a year or so ago. It's worth recalling that Chile was shaken by huge protests just before COVID hit at the end of 2019. Argentina saw through recently the legalization of abortion on the back of the women's movement campaigns. Uh, Bolivia, of course, saw a coup and a, then a very strong response from the streets against the far right. Um, and Ecuador just held uh, the first round of its elections in which the left leads um, and in, an indigenous party narrowly missed uh, the runoff and came in third place. Um, and we'll be talking about all of this in just a bit. But we have dealt with some of this uh, recently, actually, all those things that I mentioned, especially Argentina, Chile and Ecuador were dealt in episode 93 with Pablo Priluca, uh, which recorded at the end of 2019, if you want to check that out. Also, I've included the link in the show notes. Okay, um, I've talked enough. I want to bring Fabio in. Um, Fabio, tell us about the process of the writing the book, because uh, it obviously covers basically every country in South America, except for Uruguay, as well as including Mexico and Cuba. And you traveled across the continent carrying out interviews. And uh, each, at the end of each chapter, there's a list of wh where the interviews you, you carried out. So I actually was interested, um, how did you find that experience? And maybe you could uh, highlight for us maybe some of the interviews or experiences in the countries that left you the most optimistic or the most pessimistic. Well, so basically on the interviews, I tried to, to get familiar with, with what was going on on these countries and in, in, uh, as seen from with those from below. So I've always tried to get in contact with social movements, um, uh, activists in general or intellectuals that look at this um, and, and work and have organic um, bonds with, this, with, with those that are struggling for for social change in these countries. I've done that uh, either in a, at a personal level as part of, of personal um, university researches and also at, at, at a group level uh, as we have a, a, what we call an extension program in, 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 in my university. So I've been taking uh, groups of 30 or 40 students to, to each and every Latin American country for the past eight years. And so, and when we do so, we have this heavy agenda of, 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 of visiting and talking um, to this um, to this activists and intellectuals. So this is, let's say, um, the ingredients for, other than obviously um, all the literature on these countries, which have been working uh, for, for different purposes for, for many years. So I would say that um, it is the offspring of years of an organic relationship with the history and with the, the struggles of those from below in Latin America. Um, I, I think that the country that most, I would say, dis disappointed me was Bolivia in the sense that uh, when Morales was elected, uh, there was a lot of expectation that this was, was going to be a government um, uh, made uh, together with social movements and since he himself was elected in a context of, of, of huge um, social uprisings um, so but then once you go to the and, and, and do this you know this research on the ground um, I ended up seeing that it's more, much more comp the issue is much more complicated and most actually most movements most social movements that identify with the defense of the nature and, you know, indigenous uh, modes of, 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 of relating with land and they were against the government. Mm. So that was, I would say that was um, um, most, uh, and actually the, the government was taking a, a quite a um, uh, repressive pattern against some of these, these people and some of these movements. So, uh, but on the other hand, it was very, it was, um, important and in, in a sense fascinating to get to uh, to see that perspective which is not very much what let's say mainstream prevails in mainstream left in Brazil or elsewhere um, and paradoxically I would say that the country that has um, that I, that I had most hope looking at was was Chile like I wrote I did the research and I wrote the chapter before. Uh, this major uh, uprising that you've described in the end of 2019. But if you look at the end of the, of, of, of the chapter, what, what was that I was sensing there? I was sensing that since Chile is, 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 is a pioneering 
experiment of, of, of neoliberalism worldwide. Uh, the effects of this agenda were also there to be mm. seen in the most obvious and let's say in a more advanced way. So the sense that I had was that the, so you had in one, in one hand, you had, for example, uh, trade union resistance, trade union is, 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 is down in Chile. So people there, they, they say that uh, talk about going on strike is like talking about sex in a convent. So mm -hmm. uh, it's so, but on the other hand, you had all this, you could sense all these malaise in the air. So we could see that different forms of, of, of rebellion were coming. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I found I found the descriptions of Chile actually pretty interesting because the way that you described it, 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 the feel of it was very different from the other countries, in part because, I guess, of the success of neoliberalism there. I mean, success in both in the sense of actually political victories, but also in the, in the sense that it it's the one example in Latin America where you could say that Latin neoliberalism seems to have kind of worked out and modernized the country. OK, we'll come on to. To, to the critiques in a bit. But because of that, what you described seemed to resemble more the experience, I think, common to what people might have in, in you know, Western Europe or North America um, than, uh, than some of the Latin American experiences, at least in kind of forms of, uh, yeah, I guess, forms of alienation. Um, but maybe we can come to discuss that in, in, in a little bit um, because I wanted to turn to, yes, I guess- But, but, but I think, I think Alex, just one point. I think one thing that's very interesting in Chile is that the, 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 the trajectory of Chile can be can be told through two very different angles. It can be that you can tell the story of Chile since the, the 80s with, uh, from the standpoint of statistics, economic statistics. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you perhaps you can portray, you know, a successful story, but then you can tell the, the story of Chile through the lives of people. It's, it's, it's a life yeah. which is wholly, completely commodified. So it's, it's basically um, a, a society where people feel very insecure, insecure, not in the sense of the violence, but insecure in the sense of, of, of making sure of ensuring that, you know, the, the basic conditions for life reproduction as such. So, yeah. so I'd, I'd say that the rebellion in Chile was a rebellion against the society of despair. And that, this is that, comes, that comes through. That comes through very clearly in the book, and I, I as I say, I found that element fascinating. Um, we should start before going kind of any more deeply into individual countries and more general themes. Um, for listeners, if you could spell out what was the progressive wave or, or the pink tide, as it's often called. Um, most listeners will probably know a bit about Venezuela, will know about Chavez, will know about the fact that it's now in crisis and, you know, maybe your position on it depends on uh, on your perspective. But, you know, you, at, at the very least, will know that things are bad there <laughs> now. Um, and you'll probably have heard about the PT governments in, in Brazil and know about Lula and how popular he was and how he did some social programs, uh, which, you know, lifted people out of poverty. But maybe you don't have necessarily much of a sense beyond that. Um and actually, the fact is that their governments are very different stripes. So what unites this as a, as a progressive wave? So broadly speaking, the South American pink tide was the election of presidents that embodied social forces that rejected neoliberalism in almost every South American country in a short time span. So Chavez was elected in Venezuela in 98, then Lula in 2002, then Kirchner in Argentina in the next year, and then, you know, in Bolivia, in Uruguay, in Paraguay, and so on. So we had this, this, this presidents that were broadly identified with the rejection of neoliberalism. So I think this is a peculiarity of the region because neoliberalism won now traditional political parties worldwide. But in South America, this has opened room for political novelty stemming from the left, either in the form of, of non-political organizations such as the PT that we just referred to, or wholly newcomers such as Morales in, 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 in Bolivia or Chavez in Venezuela. And why was that? I think that the key to understand that was that um, it was a context when neoliberalism was strongly contested, contested on the streets. So since the Caracaso in Venezuela in the early 90s, which was a massive rebellion where hundreds of people were killed, to five years in Bolivia that there was, uh, you know, this massive social unrest in the early 2000s, and passing through, you know, Argentina in, in December 2001, when five presidents were toppled by, 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 by popular protests, neoliberalism had lost its legitimacy everywhere in the continent. Mm. So it's against this background that progressive presidents were, 
were, were elected, but they were perceived differently among those from below and among those from be, uh, below. So I would say that to those from below, uh, progressivist presidents were seen as, as, as a crisis management alternative. It was a path to bring politics out of the streets and back to the institutions, particularly in places like the ones that I've just mentioned, like Bolivia and Argentina. However, as, when, when seen though from the standpoint of those from below, progressive politics embodied hopes of social change. They embodied an alternative social project. So among all different shades of progressive politics that we've just mentioned, what was the progressive bet? What was their common points? So basically it was a social change without confronting the roots of, of, of problems, the, the colonial roots of problems that we referred to in the beginning of the episode. So which is basically the articulation between dependency and inequality. So, and, so, and their landscape was, was, was conciliation and to improve the conditions of those from below, but again, without confronting the roots of the problems. Um, this win-win situation was made possible against the background of the commodity super cycle as the Chinese commodity expanded in the early 2000s. So cash transfer policies went hand in hand with, with, with a slight improvement in wages in most, of, in most countries and also with the popularization of credit in every case. So how did this bet evolve? We could say that it was successful at first to the extent that all these presidents were either reelected and or they elected their successors, except in the case of Paraguay, where there was a preliminary coup, uh, very likely the one that happened in Brazil a few years later. So if we look at Latin America, 10 years ago, when Lula left the presidency, we would listen Obama considering him to be the most popular politician on earth, while the, the, the cover of the Economist portrayed the, uh, the Rio de Janeiro's Christ, the Redeemer, you know, the statue of the Christ the regime, Redeemer rising like a rocket with the caption, Brazil takes off. However, 10 years later, the tide seems to have uh, completely reversed. And this is, I think this is the question that the book addresses. How do we understand this reversal? Um, so if you want me to, 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 to give you a short uh, answer on that. Well, maybe we can come back to the, uh, to the reversal in, in a bit because um, it's okay. maybe worth, worth uh, going through and, and setting out kind of what actually did happen. But I think, as you say, the, the unifying factor was a revolt against neoliberalism um, and which, which uh, and those rather, the, the failures of neoliberalism were revolted against either on the streets or in the ballot boxes and, and both. Um, but yeah, again, the, the kind of unifying element beyond that is is maybe harder to find, other as you say, um, other than this notion of taking revolt from the streets and putting it into the institutions. Um, it might be actually interesting to start as as we discuss kind of different countries. Uh, start with Ecuador because that's they've had elections there. The first round in February and the second round will be at the beginning of April, um, and it's been you know a bit in the news, I guess, and it, uh, at least in in sort of global news over the past um, period. So. You've written a piece recently in Portuguese. Why uh, basically criticizing the, the we're trying to present the way that the left has understood it internationally as, as somewhat incorrect. So what, what's your correction that you wish to offer? Well, I'm, I'm not at all on that. Many people have written and there was even an open letter um, addressed to, to important outlets such as Jacobin and uh, which I really appreciate. It's, it's, it's an outlet that I have the, the utmost respect, but there have been pieces uh, portraying the, the, this, this election in a, in a, in a, uh, in a way that um, I can't agree. And what, so what, what was the picture then? So there were basically there were three competitive candidates in the election. There was a young economist who represents um, the, the, the Ecuadorian version of progressivism that the Ecuadorian version of progressivism is embodied by President Rafael Correa. He, he ran the country between 2007 and 2017. Then he left the presidency, but he elected his vice president as, as a president. His name is Lenin Moreno. So, he didn't they, they, to his name. <laughs> yeah, no, he didn't. Uh, soon they, 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 they broke relations. They then they 
uh, uh, you know, a political and judiciary dispute ensued so that Correa was unable to run for the presidency again. And that's why he has, but Lenin Moreno on his turn, he became very unpopular. There was this massive popular uprisings in Ecuador by the, the end of 2019 again. So anyways, as Correa cannot run, he had this 36 year old economist running in his place. Then against him, you have, you know, a, a, a conservative uh, traditional, an old fashioned uh, politician that embodies, you know, financial capital, who would be his, his, his main uh, um, opponent. But then you had a third candidacy that was really competitive that, that, was, that came from the indigenous movements, the so-called Pachacutic uh, party, because Ecuador as Bolivia and Peru are countries in Latin America where um, indigenous organization and the presence of, of, of people with, with, with um, you know, indigenous roots is very, is politically very important. And it is also important in terms of, of the demography of these countries. So basically this, uh, this uh, mainstream left, let's say, so to speak, uh, portrayed this last candidacy as a sort of a Trojan war horse of the right. And this is a misreading of the situation for two key reasons. First, because uh, this uh, indigenous candidacy, his name is Yaku Perez, he basically embodies the defense of the nature, the water, the territories, and, uh, and of the people who inhabit and work this land. So again, it should be recalled that despite the press that uh, Morales government or Correa uh, has got in abroad, both these governments, they, 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 got it, they came in odds with, with the grassroots movements, grassroots movements that defend their territories against the exploitation of natural resources which is something that in Spanish they call extractivism. So, and, 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 and at times they turn pretty repressive against this, this movement. So the key issue here is that this dispute should not be portrayed as a left against right situation because grassroots support both in Ecuador and in Bolivia has been shattered or at least divided uh, since, since long. So I would say that the fact of the matter was that the Paris candidacy, the, indigen the indigenous candidacy was perceived much more as a threat for Ecuadorian progressivism than this uh, old fashioned right wing politician. So that once, so once the, you know, the, the first round of the elections came to, to a closing and they were, the, the results, uh, when, when there was 1% of the votes were, were missing, you know, to, to, to give the final result, uh, the, the, in, the Indian candidate was ahead, but, but they, were, they were basically tied. And then there was, there was, it took a week for the final result to come out. And then what these people say, the people that support this candidacy says, is that in the meantime, Correa, you know, Ecuadorian progressivists, they came in, into, into an understanding with the right wing candidate so that basically they're denouncing that there was fraud in the election. I'm not in a position to say whether there was fraud or not, but the point that I want to make here is that this, this indigenous candidacy cannot be portrayed as, as, a, as a Trojan horse of the right, that they have a very meaningful they, and, and, and important agenda, which is, which is, which is a clear cut from, you know, from standard progressivism in the sense that it's not for the exploitation of natural resources in the sense that it has happened in every Latin American country during these years. So I would, I, I would dare to say, I, I don't intend, I don't mean to idealize this candidacy, but I, have, but I have no doubt that they are closer to a landscape of radical social change that the continent badly needs than the progressivist candidate. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, and I think we're, we're going to put a pin in that because it's an issue that we're going to come back to uh, later on in this discussion because it's something that runs through uh, the issues, especially in the Andean countries, I guess, more than more than elsewhere. But um, this, this notion of uh, maybe indigenous activists challenging what is called extractivism. I'm a little bit skeptical of the category myself, but we'll come on to that. Um, and, and it's kind of conflicts with maybe left governments which uh, or left parties, which um, perhaps are, are less radical than they seem. So anyway, we'll come back to that, as I say. Where I want to start uh, going through what the progressive wave was, uh, well, we should start at the beginning, in the beginnings of Venezuela. Um, you know that really it's the elections of Lula and then especially of the Kirchners in Argentina, which really initiates the wave uh, or initiates this period pre precisely as a wave. 
But the whole thing starts in Venezuela in 1998 with Chavez. Um, and obviously, we know the denouement. Uh, everyone's familiar with the social disaster there now. Um, so maybe could you explain how the Bolivarian, in your view, the Bolivarian, the Bolivarian process degenerated? Um, and I guess I'm going to p- propose three different options and maybe you're, you want to say, no, it's none of those and that's fine. But <laughs> I think the three ways that are, it's generally seen as one, um, which is a, a radical interpretation, is that it's a capitalist crisis, actually, um, that it's the oil price falling and, and so on. And, and basically it's a, a crisis of, uh, yeah, basically the capitalist economy. The, the traditional view in the center and the right is that it's a crisis of socialism. Um, and there's another view which actually holds that the problem is precisely that Venezuela ended up in a sort of halfway house um, in the process of its transformation uh, between capitalism and socialism, to put it in the simplest terms. Uh, so how do you see it? If I would have to pick one of the three, I would pick the third one. Why, is, why I would do so? Because I think that the peculiarity of Venezuela in the broader context of the pink time was that it was the only country where when the, the government was faced with a backlash from the right, it, 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 its reaction was towards radicalization and not towards mm-hmm. you know, stepping back. So when there was a, the, the, an attempt, a coup attempt in 2002, followed by a, lock, a lockout, you know, then the economy of Venezuela plunged in a terrible the, the recession at that time. Well, at, at precisely at that time was when Lula was elected in Brazil and then Kirchner in Argentina. Then I, I, I guess he just looked around and said, well, I have friends now other than Fidel in Venezuela. So why not go, go radical? And, um, um, and, and I also think Chavez was genuinely committed to, to, the, to the cause of those from below. This is my very personal perception. So he did, but he, but he wasn't followed on that radicalization by his, um, his other, um, his fellow um, presidents. Um, but in any way, so, so I think this is, this is the specificity of the, Venez- of, of the Bolivarian um, situation. However, having said that, Benev- uh, Venezuela never became a socialist country in any meaningful way. I think, um, and I think, when we look at the, uh, the when we try to understand uh, what happened in Venezuela, I think we have to look at the contradictions of the process within itself. Like uh, obviously the U.S. embargo recently have aggravated our problems, but they're not the cause of the problems, and they're not uh, going to solve the problems if once it's this, it, it is over. So I would highlight two contradictions. The first one on the political level was the idea of building a communal power, but a communal power from above as a state initiative, or at least supported by the state. So there was always this, there has been this idea, which I find very important and meaningful of building what they called um, communal power. Uh, But again, Venezuela is, is a country that also because it's an oil rentier country. And this affects every sphere of, 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 of life in Venezuela. That includes, you know, the organization of labor and also social movements. The point that I want to highlight here is that Chavez was elected without any uh, uh, meaningful um, organic support. There was not a political party and not, um, uh, you know, labor, the, 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 the largest labor central in Venezuela was for the coup in 2002. So it was... Mm. So he, he was re- pretty much supported by the military as a party. So then he had the challenge. How? So this is a challenge that we have to face. So how? And, and, and then it was, he was, uh, his leadership was very personal. So how do you overcome the personalization of the process? How do you overcome the lack of, 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 organic, of organic structures? And I think there were several attempts on that, on that level, but they ultimately faced this contradiction that I've just pointed to. The second I think I just wanted to to jump in a thing and maybe repeat that back, but also draw out something that might be a little bit more universal than just the Venezuelan case, which is that, I mean, what you have is a revolt against neoliberalism, you know, in the streets, um, but which actually leads to the ballot box, right? So Chavez is elected democratically. Um, The weird thing is that he radicalizes in power, which is, which is a, yeah, which is an oddity, I think, probably looking across a lot of the history of the world to actually radicalize once you're in power. Um, but the, what's, what's interesting, as you say, is that he lacks this organic social base. So it's something that happens at the ballot box, but doesn't really have the social fundament. And yet he tries to 
do something radical from above, not just in an authoritarian way, but also in a way of trying to kind of make a sort of withering away of the state. I mean, it, as you say, this, trying to devolve power to communal organizations, decentralize power um, at the same time that he's really dependent on the military. So there's this weird contradiction there, right, where he's dependent on uh, the, the, the kind of armed wing of the state and at the same time trying to devolve power um, more locally to the commune level. You're absolutely right, Alex. So one, when I was in, I was in Venezuela a few times in recent years. So one, once I, I talked to the minister of this, they had a ministry of the communal power. So I talked to the vice minister and then he, he told me to turn the mic off and, 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 and said, you know what? Uh, he said two things. He says, first, we are a ministry that works, you know, to, to, to disappear. Because ideally, if, if communal power is there, the state is going to fade away. The second thing he said is that this is a very um, controversial issue within Chavismo, within Bolivarianism itself. And then he gave me an example. Because you, you know that Chavismo in power, they, they were, you know, they were world, world record holders of, 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 of elections, and consultations. He had like 17 different elections <laughs> while he was in power. That was like 13 years. And they won every one of them except for one. And precisely this one, one of the, the topics that were there was, you know, to, to a, a sort of um, uh, a go ahead to radicalize, you know, the socialist, uh, at least the the socialist drive, at least on the, on the rhetorical level and the communal power drive. And they lost that one. And then what this vice minister told me was that this election was many people within Chavismo, within Bolivarianism was against that because basically they were state power. So if you're, you know, if you're the mayor in a, in a small city in Venezuela, you don't want any communal power because you are in power. You are the mayor. So you don't want a, a, a conflict um, a entity so, so this points to this, and, and, and again, if you look at the military, the military, they usually, they associate, you know, um, uh, they don't, uh, this, this, this uh, protagonism of those from below, this is, they look as, as, as a threat for national sovereignty. So indeed, we can, we can perceive, you know, the contradictory um, uh, aspects of this process um, from this point of view. I think a second important contradiction is the fact that uh, Venezuela intended to diversify the economy, so, but through the resource, resourcing to, to oil. So how do we employ oil rent to overcome oil dependency? This is again a paradox. This is very difficult to resolve. And this is an issue that Venezuela has been facing uh, for the last hundred years. This is not new to, 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 to Chavez. So, mm -hmm. and, and, and again, this has, this has effects in every um, sphere of, 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 of life. For example, on culture, Venezuela is the only South American country where baseball is more popular than football. This has to do with, with a sort of a cultural mimicry with the US, with Miami. So this is so, so oil dependency, oil renterism is, 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 a, is a phenomenon that, is, that pervade, pervades uh, the social fabric of Venezuela. And I think um, and it's very clear that Chavismo was unable to overcome that. Mm, yeah. I mean, something, this is a little bit out there and, and it's probably wrong, but it does strike me that th at least the, the comparison, you could make a comparison with even uh, Jeremy Corbyn, where there, there, if he had been elected, if he had actually won the election, you know, he would also have been in a situation where lacking a social base, but having been elected, perhaps wanting to radicalize, um, but basically being in charge of a rentier state as well, except the rentier there, rentierism there is uh, based on rising asset prices, especially houses um, and the city of London. So um, maybe maybe that's kind of a, an, unlike, an unlikely comparison. I don't know if there's any basis to that. Well, but in uh, any case, you're drawing the attention to an, another issue, which I think it's important. All these governments, they bet on doing politics from within, let's say politics yeah. through the parliament. And I think that the shortcomings of that are also are, are, are becoming obvious. Yeah. And we're going to come back to that, actually, because I want to ask specifically about that in just a little bit. Um, but I want to turn to actually Argentina. We're going to actually probably not talk very much about Brazil as we go through this, because on this podcast, we've talked about it a bunch. But, you know, always feel free to to bring Brazil in when, when it comes to it. And we'll certainly discuss Brazil when it comes to its international relations and uh, regional integration. But first, anyway, Argentina. Um, 
under Kirchner Yuzumo, it's probably one of the more moderate governments of the whole progressive wave, but one where you actually had a very radical situation in 2001 after the huge debt crisis, which uh, through Argentina, I think you wrote, you know, it was the first time Argentina had really experienced underdevelopment, in the, which is something as common to the rest of the continent, but Argentinian, or many Argentinians had never really experienced that. Um, and yet what the Kirchners did in power was take the path of least resistance. Um, could you explain what that means? Um, because you obviously have this massive energy from the streets, but also um, an elite which is you know, still there effectively, which uh, was, was rather against the Kirchner's uh, rule. So how, how, what, did the, what was the Kirchner's balancing act? Yes, just to give people some background, like in 2001, so Argentina was one of the countries in South America that had one of the harshest um, um, uh, neoliberal agenda. And this has to do with the fact that that dictatorship in Argentina was was uh, the most lethal one in the in, in the southern cone. So that between uh, 76 and 83, they killed uh, and disappeared with 30,000 uh, people. So the conditions, obviously the conditions to resist and to organize after dictatorship was gone were much worse in Argentina as compared to Brazil. Uh, so, but then, so when I said that neoliberalism that was very radical was to the fact that they privatized everything and, and they even had um, their currency was equivalent to the dollar. They came very close to dollarizing their economy. But anyway, this came to, to, to a stop in, in late uh, 2001. And it was this massive rebellion, which was, and as, as I said, they, they toppled five presidents in a row in a very short time span. And it was a wonderful context. I was there, Alex. And, and you know, that's, it's the kind of situation where you learn in practice what people mm -hmm. mean when they talk about the re revolutionary conjuncture. Because, you know, you would see people going uh, in the streets and distributing leaflets and say, okay, tonight at 6, 6 p.m. we're going to meet at this crossroads to discuss the problems of the country. If I do that in Brazil today, nobody's going to come. But in Argentina, you would see crowds gathering. And so, and then they'll get representatives to meet in, in, in a park on the weekends. And then I would go to, to the park and you would see 3,000 representatives of different, you know, this um, different neighborhoods in the whole Buenos Aires. And this was happening all, all over the country. So this is the kind of, of, of social energy that Alex is talking about. So then what happens? Then elections. So to make it short, so Kirchner comes to power and there was three. Um, um, so first Nestor, then his wife. So he was, that was the progressive um, version, the Argentinian version of progressivism. So when I say that he took the least, the path of least re resistance, it's, it's, it's basically because if you compare what happened, the, the, the Kirchner administrations to the PT administrations in Brazil, they're more radical than the Brazilian ones. Mm -hmm. But they, but I think they were the, 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 the least radical they could be, but, but the key here is not the temper of the Kirchner or the temper of Lula. The key here is the social unrest that 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 was, you know, under which uh, they came to power, which was yeah. very different. There's basically, in there's basically a, a proto-revolutionary context and they obviously would never have survived in power had they turned their back entirely on the, on the streets exactly. and not given the people anything, but they also yes. didn't want to pursue confrontation with the elite. So they, that's what you mean by the exactly. path of least resistance, right? Exactly, exactly. Thank so, you so for me, summarizing my thoughts. <laughs> so let me just so let me just ask, moving on from that, actually, because what seems to divide the continent, at least, or seems to divide one way of dividing up, I guess, these different experiences, is that in certain situations, you had this sort of almost proto-revolutionary moment, or certainly a, a huge social revolt, and in others, you didn't. And so Bolivia and Ecuador maybe are cases where you also had the possibility for radicalization. Whereas Brazil is obviously the opposite case and one where um, for as much as there was a, a kind of a rebellion against neoliberalism um, of, that was experienced over the, over the 1990s, um, there wasn't any you know, massive kind of proto-revolutionary situation. There was, what there was was it, it manifested itself purely uh, through institutional means at the ballot box and, and PT1. So if we take what you say about in your criticism of the Kirchners of basically trying to dampen down that kind of revolutionary energy um, in Brazil, where there wasn't that revolutionary energy, maybe we can't be so critical of Pete because, uh, you know, there wasn't the ground there for taking a more radical avenue. I'm being provocative here, but uh, what do you think of that? 
I think, well, the first thing is that um, this, is, this is a sort of um, uh, a, a, a question, a, a dead end question, because also the politics that the PT has been putting into place, at least since the, the 90s, has been a politics of, of not fostering, you know, uh, uh, the, the protagonism of those from below. So, so this is, um, uh, so, but, but then you ask me if, 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 the, if the PT could not have taken a more radical avenue. So my, my first answer to that is, is, is what I always say to, to, to my students, life always has alternatives, but every alternative has its costs. But in the PT case, I think that the key issue here is that a radical avenue was never on their table. It, it, it has to be understood that since their defeat in 1989 against Color Di Mello, the PT has since then focused on winning the presidency and they have not focused on social change anymore. So in, through that path, they became very good on what we could uh, describe as best practices for the management of, of, of social tensions, for the management of the poor. And actually they have exported these practices worldwide. That's why, that's what Obama has in mind when he says that Lula is the most popular politician on earth, because there is something there which is valuable, you know, worldwide. But so, so basically this is what the PT has to offer, a socially sensible or a socially sensitive and well done management of social tensions under neoliberalism. So it has to be understood that this, so this is their game. So their yeah. game is within the, the boundaries of institutional uh, politics. Yes, they have no interest on, on social radicalization of any sort. What they really want is to, is to be part of, 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 of state power and have the largest share on it, which is the presidency if possible. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree with any of that, but we, it's worth noting to listeners that we're recording this the day after uh, Lula has regained his political right after um, his, the, the slate's been wiped clean and on the charges against him, um, which means that we actually have the prospect in 2022 of having uh, a sensible manager of Brazilian capitalism like Lula come back, which actually sounds like utopia right now compared to what we have. Uh, that's how bad things are. Um, let's let's move on, though, because and, and here I want to stop talking about specific countries and talk about it, some of the broader themes of, of the progressive wave. And I'm sure um, listeners who might not be familiar with so much with the specific context will be interested in hearing kind of what are the, the political tensions that that um, I guess tie together this period um, and these movements. So on the one hand, you've already mentioned that the parliamentary arena and institutional politics has served as a kind of counter-revolution to circumvent change. So like we just heard about the Kirchner's channeling all that energy on the streets to to, through the institutions um, acts as a way of dampening down uh, that enthusiasm. So you're kind of critical of, of kind of the par parliamentary, you know, the parliamentary means, I guess. Um, but at the same time, you're also critical of anti-democratic or authoritarian tendencies that have emerged in certain progressive governments. So, you know, in Ecuador, you've had some interference with independent institutions um, or the dependence in the military in Brazil, or even maybe corruption in uh, excuse me, depends on the military in Venezuela or a corruption in Brazil. Um, so how, how do you square these two of being critical of, uh, of, of channeling things back in the, the energy of the streets into parliament while at the same time also wanting to uphold parliamentary democracy? I think this is an excellent question because this points to a paradox. A paradox is different from a contradiction in the sense that a paradox has an explanation. So what is the explanation here? I think that the key issue here is that progressivism became part of the establishment. Or to use Marx's expression, they became the left wing of order. So their initial bet was that they would prevail playing the electoral game. And that happened indeed, as, as, as we have already mentioned. However, in the case of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela, they, um, the more they embodied order the more they interfered in institutions, uh, this became part of their playbook. So, mm -hmm. and they interfered in, in, in institutions not to foster change, but to keep state power. So, so basically, and this is a different situation compared to Brazil, because in Brazil, uh, there was never, you know, this, um, uh, this um, uh, 
penetration in political and judicial institutions in a sense comparable to, to any of these three countries. So the thing is that they are not, so instead of, let's say, work to, uh, to make the state fade away as was the communal project in Venezuela, they started you know, playing along the rules of the game, but they started playing the rules of the game in the sense that they were just the strongest uh, uh, the, the party in the dispute. So they were just winning elections, but then they started also being part of state power. And then they start, this, is start, this becomes, a, 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 yes, a, a, a project of power and pervading or dominating, running these institutions becomes part, has become part of their power in their project power in these three cases. This is not comparable to, to, to the Brazilian case then. That's, and, and, and by the way, this is why Lula was, or Dilma was impeached in, in 2016 and why Lula was arrested. So this is, this is what, what, what the, the, the key difference is. Yeah, yeah. Um, they certainly got played by, by the system in, in, in Brazil. I mean, there wasn't, uh, in fact, you know, the PT governments were very good actually at not interfering in institutions. They created the conditions for anti, the anti-corruption investigations by giving the, the federal police independence and so on. So um, I yeah, guess so, that, that, sorry, in that way so it's quite is, different. Uh, yeah. yeah th and this is the paradox. Like I had a, I, 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 I read a work um, recently of a, a student that was working comparing uh, Brazil and Venezuela. And basically, the, con the conclusion that he was coming to was that Venezuela was still in power because of the anti-democratic nature of some of the measures that the government has been taking since 2015. And Brazil and Lula was down and Dilma was down because they respected, let's say, the, the Republican institutions of Brazil. So this is, a, again, a paradox. Okay, so um, maybe let's turn also to, to kind of different societies and something that we foreshadowed already, particularly Bolivia and Ecuador, because I, you've already mentioned indigenous politics, and I want to be critical here um, and say, you know, isn't there a danger of, of fetishizing the indigenous populations as authentic, rooted in nature, organic, and so on? Um, because as you even actually know in relation to Bolivia, that there's indigenous who are even kind of petty capitalists uh, in the cities, but there's also kind of indigenous in communities and there's different indigenous groups and so on. So, I mean, isn't this indigenous politics, I mean, to be really critical, you could even say that it's uh, wielded as some form of capitalist ideology um, against a, a more uh, developmentalist left. Um, how, how would you respond to that? I think I think this is a this is a true risk, um, but I think this this has been played out well by the Morales government himself. So he portrays himself as a defender of nature, somebody that you know stands for the well-being of people, and then he associates uh, the coca leaf with you know with indigenous people. But then, it's, when you look at when you think of uh, indigenous people as those that live from the land and have, you know, organic relation with that specific piece of land and have all these, you know, spiritual or whatever kind of bonds they have with those lands. These people, they have been antagonizing with the government. So, so you have to, so this, this can be used both ways, I would say. Um, I think that, however, I think there is a, a, a very important point that this um, indigenous politics um, point to which is uh, the need of, of, to look for alternative patterns of civilization. So look for, I would say, for values that are not just opposite, but they're different from the prevailing ones. For instance, the progress paradigm. So, and if, if, if not for any other reason, just because of, of, the, of the ecological situation that we're facing in the planet. So, so I think the left has to, has to uh, rethink the, 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 the progress paradigm. And I think this, uh, the struggles that come from below, from the territories, they offer uh, a valuable, uh, they have a valuable voice on that, on helping us to rethink of that. So, because I don't think that 21st uh, century has to be, uh, socialism has to be more productive than capitalism. They don't have to, you know, to go to the moon and to have the deadliest uh, nuclear weapons, perhaps like the, the Soviet Union once, once thought. I think it has to be more human. It has to, to, to give people life a chance 
So if, if, if not for anything else, if, because if not, humanity will be over. And I think so. But then on the other hand, they often they overlook, I think, the, the economic dimension of social change, how to build uh, social relations uh, that go beyond, let's say, um, the, the, the capital uh, and, and, and the society of, of merchandise. So um, I think this is this is a handicap of, of many of these uh, living well um, rhetorics. But again, I think so, that so they maybe, point to... Sorry, just before anything else, maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what le- living well means, because it's something that's been adopted across many Andean countries. Yes, this is, this is a very broad concept, but basically it refers to... Um, um, a, a patterns of, 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 of life that are not uh, presided, you know, by individualization and commodification of life. And they find a source to this thinking on uh, Aboriginal or, you know, originary people's um, modes of, of, of life, which in, and, and, and their, and let's say their heritage, which is pretty much alive in this country. So, so it's so it is an angle that criticizes, let's say, uh, the individualization of, of 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 social bonds and also this uh, what they've been calling extractivism. You know, the exploitation of natural resources and damaging nature and so forth. But uh, again, they have this. Um, the, the, it's, it's not a Marxist approach necessarily, and as such. Uh, they don't. They don't necessarily. This often they overlook. You know the economic dimension of, of social oppression. I think. Yeah, I mean, I was actually going to ask about that because to me it sounds a little bit like a certain moral economy approaches, kind of wielded against neoliberalism or commodification, and so on. A moral economy here meaning uh, relations where fairness overrides market imperatives. So fairness being often rooted in notion like in customary notions uh, in sympathy and reciprocity rather than commercial instrumentality. I mean, so this is all very certainly pre you know, in, in some sense, pre-modern um, and certainly pre-Marxist. And for myself, I mean, as a Marxist and a modernist, um, this is kind of a bit heretical for me. So I, I have a certain problem with that. I mean, is that, can that really be the basis for 21st century socialism, especially given that these societies in large part are already fully modern and individualized, whatever uh, kind of remnants there are still of, of uh, traditional bonds. Yes, I, I think you, you, you point, the, 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 you're pointing to a very uh, difficult issue, which has to be, um, which has to be discussed and faced. But my, I think the point I want to make here is that, uh, I'll make a personal note. I think 10 years ago, I was much closer to this position that you're describing now. So uh, after the, 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 the experience, the political experience of the pink tide, and after all this, this field research that I've done in all these different countries, I, 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 and, and, and also looking at the, you know, the, the intensity of the ecological crisis and the pandemic and you know, all these things that everybody um, knows, I think that uh, we're not gonna get out of this through the, 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 the paradigm of modernity or, or of progress. I don't know what, what the paradigm would, would be. The one thing is certain, yes, we have to go beyond the sociability of capital. So uh, this is, and I think this is, uh, this is one, one, one uh, weak aspect sometimes in this discourse as, as, as already highlighted because, um, because the, 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 the system of capital works as a totality that embraces all spheres of life. So as such, it has to be addressed and dismantled. So we have to look at, at as a totality. You cannot go back to 19th century utopic socialist um, views. But uh, again, um, we're not going to go through, I don't think we're going to get out of this through the, the paradigm of the development of, 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 of the forces of, of the means of production and, and even the state. This has to be... Um, strongly called into question. And I think that the analysis and the discussion of, of, of this experience of the pink tide offers a, v- a valuable point of view to reflect and to discuss these issues that have that that that, that, that have to be addressed to let's say to, to the left worldwide. Yeah, I mean I certainly think you know, I, I'm not sure I agree with that, but I certainly agree that innovation is necessary because um, while obviously neoliberalism has failed, I think also return to 
uh, import substitution, industrialization, and national developmentalism of, of mid 20th century um, is not desirable and in any case impossible. So something else will be necessary. And I think maybe one way of, of discussing this um, is to discuss maybe extractivism or what, what's called extractivism. I'm skeptical of, of, the, of the ism because, I mean, the extractive industries are probably necessary. I mean, there's, there's things that need to be dug out of the ground that we need for modern economies. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there is a real problem. And here I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you, Fabio, that uh, the dependency on primary exports has been a disaster for Latin America. Um, and, it, and in fact, in some ways, this whole period of the progressive wave shows that because it was only to a certain extent possible because of the rise in commodity prices. And once those crashed, uh, so did those parties riding that wave. So maybe we could talk a little bit about this. Um, what What is your primary critique of what is called extractivism? Is it an ecological point or is it one about dependency? It's both. Um, we have to remember that uh, Latin American societies, as you highlighted in the beginning of this, of this talk, they are a product of the expansion of, let's say, of, 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 of um, com- European uh, mercantile networks in the context of transition between feudalism to capitalism. So basically the point that I want to make is that these societies, they were, they were forged as commodities, at themselves as commodities. So the, 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 the work of people and the, and the richness that is produced in this, the wealth that is produced in, in this society, they, they have not never addressed the needs and aspirations of their own people. They're always, you know, subject to, to this uh, broader drive that connects them with, you know, with, with the, 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 the circuits of capital and with the, the circuits of dependency. So you have to bear in mind that this is what dependence, so dependence, so sorry, so extractivism in Latin America means deepening this, the pattern of exploitation of the territory, exploitation of the people, and, uh, um, and exporting uh, commodities. Um, then when we look at the, so you said, so I don't think that going back to national developmentalism um, idea or the import substitution, industrialization and so forth, I think you're very, you're very right. I think this, this idea is the equivalent to the discussion in, 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 in industrializing countries of going back to Keynesianism. You cannot go, you're not going back to Keynes in the 21st century for many reasons. First reason, because as Hobsbawm has pointed out, the, the key drive to, to the welfare state was the existence of the Soviet Union, which is not there anymore. Then you don't have the, the, the pressure of those from below, you know, because the social fabric of our societies are, is, is all going, you know, the, the, the labor is not, is not the same thing as, as, as it once was, organized labor. But then you have the, 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 the crisis of, of capital accumulation on itself that has been, you know, diagnosed, diagnosed through different lenses uh, that since the 70s, the, the, the impossibility of, of recovering, you know, expanded cycles of capital accumulation. So how does that reflect in, in Latin America? This re- reflects with this, the, 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 the um, observation that we cannot go back to national industrialization. And so, uh, so when we look at, 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 the, what, at progress at, at the pink tide, we observe that even in the countries that during the commodities boom, even in the countries that once were industrialized, such as Brazil and Argentina, commodity export share of the economy has raised and not industrialization. And in Venezuela, the dependence on oil has also raised. So these are so this is in this sense, we could say that this was a regressive progressivism, regressive in the sense that we went back further back. Mm. to the, to the speci- specialization on the export of commodities. So I think that addressing the issue of est- extractivism, as, as, as you put it, is, uh, is key both economically, but also from the, the standpoint of, of how are we going to imagine different social uh, relations and a, a different uh, political landscape that, is not, that doesn't have progress as its, as its paradigm. Right. So if 
obviously the dependency on on you know primary exports has been really problematic it's uh, been complicit with huge deindustrialization um and really is at the root of kind of dualized societies vast inequalities um those who reap the benefits from primary exports uh and everyone else who doesn't so uh, and and part of that story is also the the kind of end of the world of work so people aren't being integrated through formal labor anymore of informalization and so on in that context it seems tempting to say well these countries need to shut off from the world kind of close off from globalization and no longer participate um as kind of servants of of the global economy and one important part of that would be one assumes regional integration but then this forms a big part of your analysis for you the regional in- integration that did happen uh was inadequate because it seems to more serve the interests of brazilian capitalists than to necessarily strengthen uh the region and to to grow its sovereignty and autonomy so maybe you could talk us through this yes this is very important because beyond you know the the specificities of 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 national processes the fact that we had this this progressive governments in all these countries simultaneously also brought about the 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 possibility of facing for example us dominance in the region which is doesn't have an equivalent as compared with asia or, or with africa latin america is the place of us dominance worldwide so uh, so there were some important initiatives to that extent and 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 and, and different initiatives so um, the the one that uh, so what is my critique regarding um, uh, brazil that the drive of this uh, regional integration was the expansion of some highly concentrated sectors of brazilian capital that wanted to do business in the region and so and this would work as as a sort of um of a, of a, of a base of support to the projection of brazilian leadership worldwide so um so basically brazil wasn't uh concern about building a team they wanted to be a leader of south america and all and every other country having you know subaltern uh, positions in that in that project that was different from the project that venezuela had which was so called the alba the alternative of bolivarian integration of latin america which was first uh, um uh, cuba was the first partner with it then many other uh, smaller countries in the caribbean and also venezuela and, and bolivia became part of it but brazil never joined it brazil proposed a different initiative which was called the union of south american nations unasur in 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 spanish and which was basically a political political integration so the criticism here is w- w- what do i mean when i say political integration they wanted every country to belong and in in, in a way so that every country could belong the criteria would be uh that um uh what would bring these countries together would be the minimum issues where they could agree with but then when you bring to the table chavez venezuela which was the most radical country at the point and the colombia f- uh, from uribe which was uh, a bolsonaro ahead of his time then the minimum issues are are, are very little so so my criticism is, is basically that integration as such is reduced to the political sphere and when it goes to the economic sphere it's basically driven by the needs of capital and capital ex- um, expansion mm-hmm. and this is not the, the so- sort of integration that latin america needs it needs an integration from below so i mean that's interesting and regular listeners will know we talk a lot about the eu very critical of uh, regional integration at that level um, precisely because it locks in political choices um it forms a sort of economic constitution uh in for in the interests of of capital um and perhaps maybe you know i'm i'm certainly of the of the opinion that you know political integration would be good um but uh but that's not realistic in in europe right now um and in fact the progressive direction points in the opposite way whereas in latin america i mean you kind of finished the book with a couple of with nine different proposals um which are really thought provoking and we're going to discuss a, a couple of them now and finish in just a little bit um talking about some of the big questions about uh, about socialism in the 21st century why not um but as to regional integration so you 
are an advocate of regional integration. Um, and you, you actually form your proposals as integration is a dimension of the Latin American revolution and that Latin American integration will be against the economy, uh, something which you've already just hinted at. Um, this at the same time goes along with a very strong defense of national sovereignty in Latin America. So I want to ask, uh, how realistic is your vision, I guess, of, of this regional integration? If movements at the moment are struggling even to seize the nation state, let alone deal with all the contradictions implicit in regional initiatives, which you've already pointed out, that if you have you know, economic integration, that will perhaps be just a playground for the largest capitalists, which will be the Brazilian capitalists. So how do, you, how do you mediate this? How do you resolve this seeming contradiction? You're very right, Alex. This, these propositions, they're not realistic, but they're not meant to be realistic. I think, um, let me make a, a, a metaphor. So if you go to, if Latin America was a, was a sick person and, and it would go to the, uh, to, the, to the doctor, the doctor would say, I would say that it has cancer. So then we say, okay, so how do we heal cancer? Because we don't have a, a cure for cancer. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that precisely this is, this is the issue. We have to develop a cure for this kind of social cancers that we have. This hasn't been developed, so we have to imagine, we have to think, you know, uh, in fresh, provocative uh, ways. So regional integration as such, what I, what I, so what is my point here? Is that the two points. First, uh, the regional integration is a dimension of, of politics of different countries. So if, if the politics of these countries are driven by, by capitalist uh, uh, concerns, regional integration is going to obey that. So obviously when I'm talking about regional integration, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, 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 of a different political landscape. Uh, the second point is that um, the point that I make here is precisely when we think of globalization on, on, what, is, on what is the world uh, pointing to and the potential of, 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 you know, of the wealth of production that the world has at this point. Regionally, we're not going to address the the most the deeper issues that our countries face individually. We're going to have to get together, and um, uh, and 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 the, the key point here is again the opposition uh, to U.S. influence and to your U.S. dominance, which obviously projects itself in the continent as as a territory for capital expansion from this uh from this country so so again i think the landscape points to that we're not we don't have the the, the the conditions here but the political message here is that we have to get to know ourselves to get closer between ourselves the different you know social movements in latin america there is a lot of of course i'm not writing that out of the blue and i'm not the first um uh to write that but, and then again, when I say that it, the integration has to go against, or, and the revolution has to go against the economy, the point that I want to make is the one that, uh, is that uh, economic growth in Latin America implies reinforcing this export, uh, exploitation of the territory, the export of commodities. This is, where, this is where economic growth comes from in Latin America. But we need a different civiliz uh, civilizatory pattern so it will have to go. So it's not going to stem from the development of, of productive forces. This is not the issue anymore. I think we're going to we're going to have to look for different, including different values, different um, uh, yes, a different um, civilizational landscape, and this has to be created. Mm. And I think that intellectuals that have organic bonds or intend to have organic bonds with these social struggles, they have to collaborate towards, you know, imagining and looking beyond what is possible, because if we stick to what is possible, we're done. So I, I want to, we have two more questions, I think, that I want to address, and they're very closely related, and they follow on directly from this, and they're kind of big questions that need to be addressed, and I don't expect uh, necessarily you to have the answers, I certainly don't, but um, you obviously, in, in saying that, um, in saying that, you know, the future 
socialism in the 21st century doesn't involve the development of the productive forces, um, which, you know, is, is difficult to swallow for me, but I also kind of think, at least from the Latin American perspective, um, might be what we have to uh, accept. Now, you say that this doesn't mean, um, or certainly you're not a, a primitivist or anything like that. Um, and I, there's a great quote, I think, in the book, which I wanted to pull out, which is, socialism can be seen as a utopia of abundance that points to the future, but a future that does not stop in Miami. And so this relates specifically to uh, consumption patterns in Latin America, that the expectation of replicating the consumption patterns you have in the rich countries of the North um, is, even if desirable, uh, is in some ways impossible, or rather it militates directly against the country's own development, because um, to do that, you need to, again, to rely on primary exports, to have uh, the foreign exchange, to be able to import these goods. Um, and so the traditional answer, the 20th century answer to that conundrum was to limit imports through, um, you know, through tariff barriers, basically the whole national developmentalist model. But we've already said that we don't want to do that. So um, what we need, um, according to the way that you put it, is to walk with your own legs, uh, with your with your head held, um, you know, above your body, basically, not to try and try not to run before you can walk and so on. So not to uh, expect high standards of consumption goods at a time when your when your country isn't sufficiently developed. Um, so maybe talk us through what that means and how you still envisage abundance in, in the society, albeit one which doesn't replicate Western patterns of consumption. So the point here, Alex, is, is, is basically that even if Latin Americans reach the level, the pattern of consumption that the US have, it's obviously that this doesn't, doesn't help anybody in the pursuit of happiness, as they say. So, Obviously, we have to go beyond the sociability of capital. And going beyond the sociability of capital involves, uh, involves uh, I, 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 it's not that I'm against the development of productive forces. The thing is that I don't think that this, this cannot be uh, the focus of a political and an economical project anymore. I think the focus has to be people's needs and aspirations. And at times, people's, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, the paradigm of development of, of the productive forces implied that we have to have industries in Latin America and so forth. And we were always running behind, you know, in, in, the, in the modernization um, rush. So what I, what I believe, looking locally in Latin America, is that the, the key thing here is how do we address the needs and aspirations of people? And then we're going to say, but perhaps we're not, so we're not going to have the pattern of conception of Miami. No, but, the, but then the, 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 the most important thing is not to be as productive of, as the US producing rockets to go, that go to the moon, for example. The, our superiority is going to come not from production, but because it addresses people's needs. Then there is another topic here, which is that obviously people's needs is all, are also historically and socially constructed. So, so obviously capitalism builds people needs so that nobody can live without a, a cell phone now, but they could 20 years ago. So this is, so this is the point that I'm, I want to address. The point that I want to address is that we, we see in capitalism, uh, uh, it, 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 is, it, it is a society where people live like meaningless lives. So I th we have to find different ways of bringing meaning to life. And these different ways of bringing meaning to life do not come through consumption. They're going to come because, uh, because you, are, you live in a more democratic environment, because you are part of the solutions, because you participate on building that society because you understand what is going on, because you see that equality, that you agree what is, what, what is, what is, what is being done. So I don't know if I can make myself clear. So I think the superiority is gonna come from different, a, a different rule. It's not, it's mm. not the, it's a different measurement. It's not productivity. So it's not that we're going back, you know, 
to 19th century and deindustrialization and so forth. But the thing is that we're going to find the meaning of life from different uh, from, 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 from different angles. So here I think the Cuban example is important because Cuba is also is always challenging for people because for those who think that the Cuban revolution was something that was supported by the, the Soviet Union, it's very difficult to understand how come Cubans are there, they stand for their project until nowadays. And I think, I think that the Cuban revolution is one of the most amazing features of, 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 you know, of, of contemporary history in the world. And the fact that they, are, they still stand against the United States is something that has to be, it's very, it's very valuable and has to be understood. But so where does, so when the Soviet Union collapsed, they went to, through the hard, to the greatest hardships that you can imagine. It's the period that they call the, the, the special period because they're, you know, the GNP plummeted, so life conditions went down. It was, it was awful situation but they stick with the government because they trust the government, they trust the process and they value two basic conquests of the revolution, which are sovereignty and the social programs, universal social problems that the revolution has. So they all stand for that in Cuba. So the point that I want to make is that Cuba is a revolution in, is, I call it a primitive revolution because it was a, a revolution in very primitive conditions, material conditions, mm. but they stand to it until today. How can you explain that? You cannot explain that through the key of the development of, because, because people find meaning on different, through, on, on, on different spheres. Yes, obviously this is all, um, uh, they're suffering. Yes, they are isolated. They've been isolated for a long time. The, the Cubans also suffer all the, the, the they, they are subject to the temptations of, of our contemporary uh, patterns of consumption. But the key here is that I think if, 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 if we don't, uh, if we don't agree that, a re that the key for revolution is a revolution on the landscape for human fulfillment, then we are bound to think that a Cuban revolution is impossible. Hmm. I mean, I think the, the, the interesting thing about Cuba is that I do, it doesn't, in my view, present a model for socialism for the world and certainly not for the rich world. Um, and I don't think it would sell very well. But on the other hand, um, the, the, probably the correct comparison uh, for Cuba is not to say is Cuba more advanced, a more advanced form of society than the richest countries on earth, but rather to compare it with ones which had a similar level of development. So compare Cuba with Honduras or El Salvador or something like that. Um, and then Cuba seems actually like a much more civilized alternative, given the fact that the others um, are overrun by drug cartels, huge inequality, and so on. Um, and so maybe that, in that sense, that maybe puts us on to the, a better understanding of where we are in Latin America and what the possibilities are. Now, I, I mean, I would still defend the, the development of productive forces as an aim. And I still think under socialism, you would have that. But um, kind of heading in that direction, it's hard to, well, I guess to put it this way, I'm kind of pessimistic because the modernization that um, both kind of uh, corporatist and uh, center left and um, developmentalist governments as well as socialist movements uh, always aimed at, that modernization seems to be no longer feasible. Um, that maybe the window for catch-up development was there sometime in mid-century, but it no longer exists in part because of patents and other things which prevent an intellectual property, which prevent uh, the adoption um, of the most advanced technologies in, in less developed countries. Probably the only country which has managed it is China. And I think it's, it's telling that we only have one uh, exception, one example which we can point to and say, well, you know, China is pursuing some form of catch-up development. For the rest of the world, it just seems um, impossible. So I guess the question then is um, to put a, and, and this is really to finish to round things off, should uh, the prospects of socialism or some post-capitalist society in Latin America abandon dreams of modernization, um, whether you want it or not, um, or whether you want to abandon modernization or not, and I don't want to abandon modernization, but maybe we have to recognize that it's no longer, it's no longer feasible. 
Yes, Alex, just one point before going to that. Like when we talk to Cuba, um, I, I, I agree. I don't think Cuba is a model. And I, I actually, I don't think there's any revolution should be a model to any other one. But I think that, but I do think that Cuba has to be understood before being criticized. And um, so, and, um, and there is, there are many shortcomings and I could make many critics to, to critiques to the Cuban revolution. But last time I, I came back from Cuba, I remember that the first thing I saw in the movies was this Ken Loach movie, I, Daniel Blake. And I remember being struck by the fact that that situation that he was facing in England, the, 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 the character in the movie was totally, wholly impossible in Cuba because in Cuba, people still talk to people People, the, 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 they, they're the opposite of the Chilean situation. If I said that, that the Chilean was a revolt against the society of despair, in Cuban people have little knowledge of what is a life based on despair. So um, then addressing your question, I think so. Um, I mean, the, the issues that you're raising, Alex, are issues that I'm confronting to daily. This is what I'm, I'm trying to, to, to work on, yes? What, are, what, are, what is a landscape for radical social change in Latin America in the 21st century? And um, um, I'm coming as, um, my perception now is that, is that the, the, the developmental landscape has to be abandoned. And I think that perhaps if you could summarize what is the challenge or at least the theoretical and perhaps the political challenge is uh, how do we have a politics that address at the same time that go against, let's say, extractivism or the, the develop, developmentalist pattern and also against the austerity agenda? So how do we have a political economy of well-being? Yes. How do you, do you imagine and think different um, uh, patterns of social organization? They are not, um, not don't go through um, the, the the law of value, don't go through commod commodified relations, but that still can address capital as a totality. I think this is, uh, this is a, key, a, key, a, a key challenge. And in my, my current work, again, if I was a doctor, I would say it's, a, it's not because I want or because I like, it's, 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 a, it's an understanding that the modernity landscape, the development of, of, of forces of production, the industrialization landscape, it has to be, it, it's not that this again, it's not that it has to be abandoned, but it has to be sidelined. And we have to have different values at the core of a socialist project in the 21st century. All right, very good. Um, this has been challenging stuff and I would insist on the regional and historical specificity of this discussion, this is about South America or about Latin America and not a discussion of models in general. I think Fabio is right to point out that we shouldn't be looking for specific models of a revolution. Um, and here really we should insist on this, that there is no model that, and that we ha have to innovate from where we are in our own historical and geographical contexts. And so this discussion is very much about Latin America within its own history, within its own trajectory and, and looking at what its possibilities are to overcome its its conditions. And actually, I really should say and repeat uh, what I said at the beginning, that Fabio's book is an excellent place to start thinking through these questions. So just to repeat, it's Power and Impotence, A History of South America Under Progressivism. I really recommend it. Uh, you should go out and get it. Uh, and of course, as always, links are in the show notes. Uh, so all that uh, remains is to say thank you once again to, to Fabio for, for coming on and having this discussion. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. And um, uh, I hope we were together um, in a, against Bolsonaro and against the Bolsonarization of the world. Exactly. The, regardless, yeah. of, of, regardless of what, we, if we were modernizing or not, first we have to save the planet, I think. Yeah, very much so. All right, that's it for us uh, this week. Catch you later. Bye-bye.